Hey guys, Digit Lifestyle here, back with another video. Um, this one from Impact Theory and uh, Arthur Hayes, who's going to explain the Great Depression and how he thinks it's possibly worse than um, the 2008. And also, he's going to talk about um, the what's going on in Europe right now. Um, Ray Dalio already um, has a video out with what he sees is happening. Arthur Hayes is an analyst; he does deep dives into uh, the the financial, the, how the world works. He also reads an awful lot of books. He's um, a prominent um, investor. And I'm going to play you a few minutes of the video, but I'm also going to leave the video link in, in the description because you guys can then go and have a look at the rest of the video yourself because it's quite long. Um, but I'm going to play you a few minutes, all right? About 15 maybe or so, because it's important. And you'll probably get the gist for after that, but it's up to you then if you want to go and watch the rest of it. Anyway, let me get this started. Ray Dalio recently said the next five years will be a period of radical disorder. Money printing, rising inflation, a potential banking crisis, and a whole lot of debt threaten to shock the global markets. And many people, including today's guest, believe that something approximating World War III has already begun. But even if that's all true, we can't control it. Whatever hand we're dealt, we have to figure out a way to play it well. So I bring you Arthur Hayes, the controversial macro investor who's going to provide a masterclass on navigating these difficult times. What are the signs that you see on the horizon that a financial crisis might be headed our way? I absolutely agree there's going to be a major financial crisis, probably as bad or worse than the Great Depression sometime near the end of the decade. Before we get there, we're going to have, I think, the largest bull market in stocks, real estate, crypto, art, you name it, um, that we've ever seen since World War II. And the reason I believe that is if we back up to like 1945, essentially Europe blew itself up. China was destroyed by a civil war and, and Japan, uh, Russia essentially fought the war for everybody else and you know, massive destruction. So if you look across the world, the only country that was left was uh, the US. And you know, they had a manufacturing base that was unharmed from the war and they essentially rebuilt the war and reaped enormous benefits and we're still you know people who are american are still living off of uh those benefits today but at the end of the day everybody's sort of believing this thing called you know keynesian economics which basically is if something gets in trouble the government should rush in uh, spend money if they don't have the money the central bank should print it and you know everybody collectively in the world depending no matter if you're you know what sort of ism you believe in subscribe to this this theory and what that means is you know we all have collectively agreed that the government is there essentially to attempt to remove the business cycle like there should never be um bad things that happen to the economy and if there are we want the government to come in and essentially destroy the free market so every time we've had a financial crisis over the last you know 80 years what happens Government rushes in and they essentially destroy some part of the of the free market because they want to you know save the system. And what does that mean? It's like whack a mole. So every time there's a disturbance, you know the central banks like you know, the Federal Reserve in the U.S. they come in, they print money, they enact a bunch of regulations, and they basically say, okay, we don't want this sector to fail. We don't want you know the creative destruction that is so called you know capitalism. If you actually believe in that. Um, we don't want that. And every, you know, five, seven years, there's another sector of the economy that's essentially price fixed. And so we've gotten to this point where, you know, globally, central banks have basically destroyed the free pricing mechanism in just about every single sector of the financial economy, except for one, which is the, the government bond markets, because they're so large, so unruly that it's practically impossible to essentially remove the market forces from this part of the market. But the problem is right now we're going to try. We've you know, gone from I know, 100% debt to GDP globally to about 360% um, as per the World Bank. And we are accelerating the amount of debt that we're adding on to the pile. Why? Because in the rich world, including China, Russia, and Brazil, we've stopped having enough kids. So the population is actually declining. So if you have all this debt and you don't have more humans being born to essentially do stuff to pay it back, 
Um, the only way to ensure the system is solvent is for the governments and the central banks to start printing money. Uh, and now we've gotten to the situation where we have all this debt that needs to be rolled over. We have a population that has been told that, hey, you're good. Anything ever happens, we, the government, are going to come in and we're going to make sure that, you know, you have enough food to eat, you got health care, uh, we're going to protect you, blah, 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 right? And all that's expensive, especially as you have less and less humans who are doing productive stuff. And so we're just going to keep adding on debt because that's the only way the government can stay in business. And now we've gotten into a situation where there's so much debt that, and it's accelerating in an exponential fashion, that in order to save the market this time, right? So I think in the next three to six months, there's gonna be some sort of major market disturbance and probably in the, the US treasury or other large global bond markets. And the solution is gonna be, let's print the most money that we've ever printed to try to save essentially this fiat financial system that we've created um, since World War II, which is gonna, in the first instance, create a massive bull market and anything you know, like stocks, crypto, real estate, things that have a fixed supply. Um, maybe they're productive, they have some earnings. And then after that, we're gonna find out, actually, the government can't save everything. They can't just print as much money as they think to try to save themselves and um, fix the price of the, the yield of their bonds. And we're gonna get a generational collapse. And hopefully that doesn't coincide with a major global conflict. Usually it does, I hope it doesn't because uh, I don't really want to live through uh, World War III while I'm alive. Um, but that's sort of the my overarching like macro cycle thesis. So, you know, massive top 2026 time frame, and then, um, you know, some sort of you know, Great Depression like situation happening towards the end of the decade. If we want to take a look at the progress of human civilization in the past 150, 200 years, it's all predicated on hydrocarbons. Um, the moment we started extracting oil uh, commercially out of the ground and turning it into thousands of different products that we all use every day that basically powered our modern life, um, development supercharged, right? You know, we went from, I don't know how many billions of people in the 1970s to today, a population more than doubled, right? And that's all because we were able to harness this particular type of potential energy of the earth that's underneath us. Okay, and we, we've piled on all this debt, we've brought forward all this future growth, and we haven't really innovated on another form of energy that makes us that much more productive. You know, maybe if the world started adopting nuclear um, today, immediately, like in small nuclear reactors in our cars, our apartments powered by nuclear energy, maybe we'd have a chance at growing our way out of this debt. Or, you know, if there's some magical alien that comes down and gives us, you know, some basic research that allows us to tap a new source of energy and like we can commercialize it instantaneously. Yes, then we can pay back all this money. Or if the population doubled overnight, right, to 16 billion people, then okay, great. We built all this stuff. There's more people that need to use it. Okay, we can pay back this debt. But barring any of these, you know, you know, I like to say it takes 18 years to make an 18 year old. So it's pretty much impossible to create humans out of thin air, no matter what any politician tells you. And, you know, we're not really, you know, what we seem to be doing is um, in certain countries is saying, you know, hydrocarbons are worthless. We want to use these other forms of energy that are less dense, less productive, and somehow think that we're going to grow our way out of this debt, which is mathematically impossible. There's just no other way other if the government wants to save itself by it than printing money and printing money isn't growth it's just a piece of paper out of thin air and once the population thinks hey there's more and more of these pieces of paper floating around there's only so many real goods there's only you know there's only so much oil there's only so much electricity well i guess i should be consuming everything i can now that's not actually generating real growth if we could just print our money and generate real growth, then Rome would have survived. Zimbabwe would be the richest country in the world. Same with Argentina. Like we've had, you know, the, the Weimar Republic in Germany. Like, if this was the answer, there's plenty of other, you know, societies that have tried this, and the the result was always the same: massive inflation, and then social unrest and collapse of the government. So I think we've proven over 
thousands of years of human history that printing money is not growth. It's a chimera and at the party it lasts for only so long and then, you know, it's bad news bears. Said that you hope that this doesn't all happen in a moment of political instability, but I would like to quote Arthur Hayes to Arthur Hayes here real fast. Uh, this is from, th this is the opening line from one of your recent articles. You said, World War III has already begun, whether the mainstream media and political elite wish to acknowledge it or not. Um, so let's talk about the political instability. We're going to get to the debt. We're going to get to the banking crisis, inflation, all of that. Um, but set the context for us right now. What What's happening right now that unnerves you from a, a political standpoint? So for whatever reason, and I don't know why, Western Europe starting and then America following has it in for Russia. And, and if you read the, I think it's Mackinder, um, his um, global home island theory that he wrote, I want to say in the early 19, early 20th, or end of the 19th century, whatever. He was a very famous um, uh, war strategist. And he basically said that the, the home island is essentially Eurasia, right? So think of China, Russia, um, Western Europe, right? Whoever controls that portion of the world controls the world. And so if you think about the naval powers, such as Great Britain and the U.S., let's talk about Great Britain first, right? What was the British foreign policy all about in the 19th century and early 20th century? Preventing a strong continent, whether it was France or Germany, they didn't care. They just don't want to unify Europe. Now, as Russia industrialized in the late 19th century, they started to worry about, okay, well, what about Russia, right? We can't have an alliance of German, strong Germany after Bismarck, uh, United Germany and and Russia because Russia has all these commodities. That would be the worst thing that could ever happen for us, Great Britain and naval power. So what do they do? That this you know a series of alliances that you know precipitated World War One, which was let's make sure that Germany and Russia do, are not friends. And essentially, that was a strategy going into World War One. You know, obviously that blew up. What was the strategy in, in World War II? You know, if you take a look at the, the rise of Hitler and you know all the different you know Western powers that were okay with Hitler as long as he was going to turn his army and just fight Russia, right? If, you know, Hitler wrote about this. He said, "We want to create the space for the the German people to essentially eradicate the Slavs in Russia and and go in there." And the Western Europe was perfectly happy about that because, again. What do they want? They don't want a united home island. They don't want a united Eurasia because that threatens the, the, the hegemon of you know, Great Britain at the time. Obviously, that didn't work out so well. Hitler turned his army on, on the other half of Europe, um, and then everybody started fighting again. Uh, and then we ended that war. And then what we were left with, we were left with the United States versus Russia again. And again, it was all about, let's make sure that you know, Russia and China aren't aligned, or um, Russia and the rest of Russia and Europe aren't aligned. That's why you know, the U.S. poured however many billions of dollars through uh, the Marshall Plan into rebuilding Western Europe to make sure it was a bulwark against Russia and the, the virus uh, of communism. And you know, I forgot. I was reading a recent book. It was called "The Wars of Asia, um, 1911 to 1949." And the author made a very good point about why communism is so hated as a form of government to anything that's not communism. And the reason it is because, you know, obviously communism has its flaws, but at its the kernel of truth for lots of people is we're going to completely uproot the, the social system. We're going to replace the classes that are oppressing us. It's not like, okay, it's one class of elites who was running things, we're going to go over to this other class of elites, which is like socialism, fascism, you know, capitalism. It's just one group of elites versus the other. Communism is let's destroy the whole class of elites and bring the people up to power. Now, obviously that never ever actually happens, but in the beginning it does. And so if you're a bourgeois intellectual and, you know, and one of these other systems, you're like, I can't have communism take over. I can't have the actual workers rise up, replace me as an entire class and then try to rule, which is why they hate communism so much. And so so you understand why we have this this, this thing going on with um, in 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 Europe at the moment. Um, I'm going to leave it there, um, but I just wanted to bring you that because like um, the I hope it 
helps you to understand where we're going and I'm going to leave a link in the description as I said um, to this because he then goes on to explain how you can get out of this but as uh, um, the interviewer said uh, um, you can't time this market there's no you, we cannot time this market but he also said that we are going to go through the biggest uh, boom and then bust in history and crypto is going to have a great big boom uh, um, everything are everything is going to go up and it's going to come back down it's where you position yourself either you position yourself now in this market or you position yourself too late i don't know right now in in my view and this is not financial advice and i'm not giving you financial advice please do not take this as financial advice if you choose to you can invest in utility assets that will boom but then we'll see the the, the coming years and the years after this whole event uh, um blows over take hold and be uh, generational wealth for those who who adopt um, the ones or the, the the utility tokens that are going to be doing stuff whether it be in the financial financial market it doesn't matter where it is social media it doesn't matter AI tech it doesn't matter um, all of those things are going to be where we go to because if we go to if we have uh, um, World War 3 then yes things will stop clearly Bitcoin will probably stop but then all it will take is somebody to switch back on the machine and and, and it because bitcoin will never ever go away you know the, the trains already left the station remember this as well bitcoin is here to stay crypto is here to stay the technology is here to stay it's only going to get better anyway digital lifestyle out take care yourself have a great day like and subscribe by the way how in the world could it be that the biggest greatest fighting entity in the world cannot audit itself until 2018 what's wrong the fact is we probably wasted hundreds of billions of dollars of the pentagon through the years uh through poor management is that correct well that'd be an under that'd be a low estimate so how can we possibly cut spending and make government more efficient if we don't even know where the money is going in 2001, Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld announced that the Department of Defense had lost more than $2.3 trillion. Cracked $2.3 trillion in transactions. At this time, the entire federal budget was only $1.8 trillion, which meant that the military had basically just oopsied away more than a year's worth of the government's entire bankroll. Look at all this cash, bro. What would you call it? The public was furious to say the least, and rumors quickly started circling about where this money ended up. Fortunately for Rumsfeld and the entire military senior brass, the public announcement of the missing money was made on a very opportune day, September 10th. Just one day later, what would have been the news story of the year was immediately overshadowed by the event of the decade, and public opinion about the military flipped on a dime from outrage to adoration. The $2.3 trillion hole in the military's budget was almost forgotten by everybody but the accountants that needed to get to the bottom of it and the conspiracists that pointed to it as proof of the inside job theory. It certainly doesn't look great. And the timing is almost a little bit too convenient. Government's interest expense will increase more between 2022 and 2024 than in the 51 year. Interest expense will increase more between 2022 and 2024 than in the 51 years prior. And with about 30% of government debt that needs to be rolled over the next 12 months, this could become a big, big drag on the economy. Now, the second way it affects the economy is corporate borrowers. Corporate debt is similar to government debt in which it's not all due at the same time, adding to this lag effect. Now, most companies, sort of like the government, they spread out their debt so there's only a small amount that's actually maturing in the one year. So it can take time until the more expensive debt replaces the cheaper maturing debt.